Well, I guess we just can't have nice things, can we? Film by film, Warner Brothers just continues to prove me right about the DCEU. They don't know what the hell they're doing. Now, every once in a while, they'll Forrest Gump their way into a good movie. Aquaman, Shazam, the first Wonder Woman. But overall, no one is steering the ship with the DCEU, and it shows. And unfortunately, it shows with this movie, too. I liked the first Wonder Woman quite a bit. It wasn't perfect, but it was a good, solid superhero adventure flick. Patty Jenkins directed, she returned to direct this one, also co-wrote the script this time, and there was no reason to suspect that giving her more control over it wouldn't be a good thing. Judging by the final product, though, that may have been a miscalculation. So WW84 picks up the story decades later, though somehow still in the past, in the 1980s. Because kids sure do love that Stranger Things show, right? And it revolves around this magic monkey's paw type MacGuffin crystal that grants wishes. It falls into the hands of a character who the movie calls Maxwell Lord, but is pretty obviously a stand-in for someone else. I'll give you one guess who. He uses it to acquire money, power, success. Diana and Kristen Wiig get wind of this, they make wishes of their own, and things spiral out of control from there. First of all, the advertising campaign didn't do this movie any favors. I put this out a couple times on Twitter, but it seemed like every commercial, every promo they aired for this, was nothing but the characters telling Diana how amazing she is, validating her non-stop and it showed a real lack of awareness about how something like that was going to be perceived. I actually lowered my expectations for the movie because of these things. Because when you see that, naturally, you think the movie is going woke. Which Hollywood still doesn't understand is not a recipe for success. But thankfully, that was mainly a failure of the advertising, because the movie itself is not really like that. It doesn't get preachy or egregiously feminist. In fact, a big part of the movie involves Diana becoming less powerful and having to struggle more to do things that she used to do easily, which I thought was one of the better things about it. Now, don't get me wrong, there are quite a few male characters who are transparently just there to be assholes, but Steve Trevor is still Steve Trevor. He's still heroic, still a great pilot, still gets in on the action. They do have a little fun with his fish-out-of-water situation, but... That's okay, they did that with Diana in the first movie, it's harmless enough. So does the movie get woke? I didn't feel like it did. Not compared to some other movies I could name anyway. But it does have a lot of other issues. There are parts of this movie that work. But there are also parts that don't work, and parts that are so patronizing and so out of touch that it's almost sad. So what works? Gal Gadot and Chris Pine. I think I enjoyed Gadot's performance in this movie better than in the first one. She's grown into the role more, she felt more relaxed, and she's still very good as Diana. Chris Pine? Great in the first one, still great here. The two of them still make a really good couple, and Pine brings something out in Gadot that isn't always there when she interacts with the other characters. Their dynamic is arguably the best part of the movie, but it's also where most of the problems stem from. It seems pretty clear to me that when the filmmakers sat down to brainstorm their Wonder Woman sequel, they didn't have much of a plan. Or any plan for that matter. The only thing they were sure to write down up on the whiteboard was, bring Steve Trevor back. So they pulled a phoenix down out of their asses and just built everything else around that. And it's obvious, because the entire rest of the movie feels like it was all designed to justify the method by which Steve returns. And the movie definitely loves having Steve back. They don't disrespect him or minimize his character. They don't play identity politics with him. They even keep scenes in the movie that they could have easily cut just to give Steve more screen time, even though this really hurt the pacing and makes the movie at least 20 minutes too long. And look, I get it. Chris Pine's great. Steve and Diana are great together. When the movie works, it's usually because of them. It's easy to see why they wanted to bring Steve back. The problem is, they already killed him. And you know before the movie even starts that he's not sticking around, so what was the point of any of this? Diana gets Steve back only to lose him again? We did this already! And you don't do anything new with it this time, so we're just retreading old ground here instead of doing something new. And considering some of the other ideas the writers came up with, this movie really could have used something new. 
Now let's talk about those other ideas, because this is where the movie really comes unhinged. And I'm getting into spoilers here. I normally try to avoid those when I can, but I don't know how else to do this. Once Steve and Diana are reunited, they get intimate. And this is the most uncomfortable thing in the movie, because Diana wished for Steve to come back, and he does, but not in a physical sense. It's weird. Steve's spirit returns, but it's inhabiting the body of another man. So this dude's mind goes dormant or something, and then Steve basically takes over his body. It doesn't make sense, and the crystal doesn't work this way with anything else. It can make other stuff just appear out of thin air, but it can't do that with Steve? It has to put his soul in someone else's body? Why? What are the rules of this thing? There don't seem to be any, it's just whatever the writers want to happen, happens. So I don't know why they had it work that way, they don't make anything of it, but that's what they went with. Here's the big problem. Steve and Diana spend the night together. But since Steve is inhabiting another man's body, and that man couldn't consent to this, and apparently was not even aware of what was happening, that means that technically, Diana raped this man. Wonder Woman is a rapist. Now flip the genders for a minute. If this was a character borrowing the body of a woman to have sex with someone, people would be all over this, screaming sexual assault and God knows what else. I haven't seen any uproar about this yet, I haven't looked for it, but I imagine people are not going to make as big a deal about it as they would have otherwise. And the hypocrisy of that really bothers me, because regardless of the genders, a sexual crime was still committed here, and the movie pays it no mind at all. Now, I might have understood if this was what made Steve start to feel uneasy about the fact that he's stealing another man's body, and that informed his character going forward, and led to him making the decision that he can't go on like this, but nothing like that happens. If it was done as part of a story, that would be one thing, but there's no story. Steve and Diana have a great night together, and then the movie just goes on, and the rape is never acknowledged. Like the filmmakers didn't even realize what they'd done, or worse, didn't care. It's like the writers were so happy to have Steve back that they never actually stopped to think about what they were doing. That's a big issue. And even if the whole thing was an accident, it certainly didn't make me more forgiving of the stuff they did on purpose. Stuff like the villains, for example. Let's talk about Kristen Wiig as the cheetah first. I've always liked Kristen Wiig. I think she's talented, and she can be really good with the right material. She worked hard to distance herself from the Ghostbusters 2016 debacle, but she's really needed a win ever since. So I was rooting for her to pull this off, but I don't think she managed it. In the first half of the movie, it feels like she's going for a Jamie Foxx and Amazing Spider-Man 2 type of thing, where the over-the-top nerdy character turns super dark, but it didn't work then, and it doesn't work now. SNL Kristen Wiig is dialed up a little too much here. She's a little too broad, a little too exaggerated, a little too goofy, and she comes off as comical when she should have been sad and maybe a little angry or resentful. Weirdly enough, though, when her character puts the comedy away, goes down a dark road, and Kristen starts playing against type, her performance gets better. And the darker she got, the closer she became to what I thought this character should have been. And she never becomes frightening like Cheetah ought to be, but by the end of the film I was like, alright, I can sort of buy this. It shouldn't have taken the entire movie to get to that point, though. I still like Kristen Wiig, but this casting was never not awkward. Then we have Maxwell Lord, and this was the character who was impacted the most by the Bring Steve Back ripple effect. Like, the writers got what they wanted with Steve, but then they had to build a whole plot around that, and Lord is the guy who facilitates this. But this is when we go back to them not having a plan, because it's as if once they had Steve, they didn't know what else to do, and they didn't seem to care about doing Maxwell Lord from the comics, so I guess they just started throwing stuff at the wall, and what they came up with was, let's do a bunch of anti-Trump stuff. 
because that'll be relevant for f***ing eternity. It's not like there's a presidential election coming up in about, uh, two months ago. Yeah, they weren't even trying to be subtle or clever about this. And the frustrating thing is, even if the movie had kept its original release date, everything they try to say with this character would still be a couple years too late to be provocative, because we've all been over this stuff now ad nauseum. Now, Heel vs. Babyface said in his review that the Trump similarities were only superficial and didn't really amount to that much. I'm going to respectfully disagree with him on that. Maxwell Lord is played as a slimy, corrupt, insecure TV personality slash con man with ridiculous hair, who has paranoid conspiracy theories, thinks everyone is against him, is terrified of being perceived as a loser, erects a giant wall to keep the wrong people out, and whose rise in power is the immediate cause of society descending into complete anarchy. Gee, what could this possibly be a commentary on? Let me think for a minute. I mean, it's so f***ing subtle, it could mean a million different things. Yeah, they were hilariously transparent about what they were doing here. Pedro Pascal does at least look like he's having fun with the role. Maybe too much fun, though. Towards the end, he's chewing scenery like there's no tomorrow. But he does make more of an impression than Kristen Wiig. And at the end of the film, they give him a sympathetic moment where you find out why he is the way he is, and Lord kind of becomes his own character finally, and you see that maybe he's not as bad as he seemed. It's a moment of humility that seems pretty unlikely to happen with his real-life counterpart. So, I guess the story wasn't necessarily a cautionary tale about the evils of Trump so much as the evils of being like Trump. Also, I think it's meant to be a comic book movie of some kind. Were there really no good Wonder Woman stories from the comics they could adapt that they had to go in this direction instead? Was this really the best idea they could come up with? I'm sorry, but this comes off like the writers, one of whom was Patty Jenkins lest we forget, really didn't know what they were doing here. The only thing they knew for sure was that they wanted to get Steve and Diana back together for a cup of coffee, but they had nothing concrete penciled in for the rest of the movie, so they just resorted to the popular Hollywood trope right now of laying on the orange man bad stuff. And even taking that out of the equation, it's crazy how rudderless this movie feels. For example, it starts with a flashback to Themyscira, where Diana's a child and she's competing in some kind of Amazonian Olympics thing. You saw it in the trailer. So her and a bunch of other Amazons have to run this crazy obstacle course. And mid-race, Diana falls behind the others, so she takes a shortcut bypassing the course to catch up, and so she gets disqualified and admonished for cheating. And Hippolyta has to talk to her about this. You'll be ready when you're ready, but until then, you don't succeed by taking shortcuts. There's no truth in that. Or whatever. Okay, good advice. And you think that this is going to be what the film is about. This is the major theme. This is part of Diana's arc. But I don't know that it is. That doesn't really come into play after this scene. To be honest, I'm not sure what Diana's arc even was in this movie. Learning not to live a lie? She's lying to herself about not being a rapist, but that never gets addressed. Learning to let go of Steve? I thought she did that in the first one. I guess at the end of the film, she's learned to appreciate the beauty of the world and the people as they are, but what did that have to do with the opening scene or the story they were telling here? Beats me. It really does feel like once they had Steve and Diana back together, they just didn't care about nailing down everything else. And it's not just Diana's arc that feels poorly constructed either. Other things are just tacked on with almost no thought put into them at all. The invisible plane shows up, but it's just thrown out there like an afterthought. Diana pulls magic powers out of her ass, and she can just suddenly make things invisible now. That's all the explanation it gets. That golden armor she wears in the trailer? You could cut it out of the movie without losing a damn thing. It's literally only in there to set up a fan service cameo in the mid credit stinger. Why doesn't Steve just come back in his own body when we've seen that the crystal can create other stuff from nothing? Why is he borrowing the body of another man, especially if you're not gonna do anything with that? Why does Cheetah get two magic wishes when everyone else only gets one? I have no idea! 
Even the 1980s setting feels pointless. There was no need for this to be in the 80s whatsoever, it's completely random. The only explanation I could think of was that this was a really delayed cash-in on the nostalgia craze brought on by Stranger Things, which died down quite a while ago. And the lack of attention to detail goes for the aesthetics, too. The visual effects are all over the place. Some of them are passable, and some are actually pretty bad. There are some really unconvincing green screen shots. And if anyone knows about unconvincing green screens, it's me! The cheetah's inconsistent, too. She looks okay when she's CG'd, I guess, but when they go in for close-ups, it's terrible. It's like they just put face paint on her. Cheap looking f***ing face paint. Wouldn't you want to do a mocap thing here? I, I don't understand this. They don't even show her transformation into the cheetah either. That's what this whole character was building up to for the whole movie, and the damn thing happens off screen. And the film isn't even consistent with how it looks. One minute, it'll look really good, like with Steven Diana's plane ride through the fireworks. It's pretty, it's cinematic, but then they go to another scene, and suddenly it's like you're watching a TV show, and it's almost jarring how uncinematic it is. Combine that with the spotty visual effects, and the movie looks oddly cheap at times, which is baffling to me because it had a $200 million budget. Where the hell did all the money go? Look, I won't say that I hated this movie. There are parts of it I liked, but those felt like the only parts the filmmakers really cared about, and everything else felt awkward or phoned in. And that's not even counting the political commentary that missed its sell-by date by at least two months. And when you factor in the inconsistent visuals, the slow pacing, the lack of attention to detail with the storytelling, the relationship with Steve that was just repeating itself, Kristen Wiig, bless her heart, just being a square peg in a round hole with the cheetah, not to mention Diana being a bona fide rapist now. I don't know how the hell you recover from that. And Wonder Woman 1984 was a pretty big disappointment. What a letdown, man. I really wanted this to be good. But the DCEU fumbles the ball yet again, and the first Wonder Woman is looking more and more like the exception that proves the rule. I'm suddenly feeling very concerned about Rogue Squadron. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Kathleen Kennedy is gonna f*** that movie in the ass long before Patty Jenkins gets anywhere near it, but if WW84 was any indication, PJ may not be as reliable as we were led to believe. So I advise you all to do as I do and keep your expectations low. Guys, let me know what you thought about Wonder Woman 1984 in the comments. Ding that bell icon for notifications and follow me on social media so you'll always know when I upload new stuff. The link is down there. Also, don't forget to thumbs up the video, share, subscribe, and make sure you're still subscribed because what really should have been marooned in 1984 instead of this movie is the YouTube algorithm. That's all for now, but I'll be back with more very soon. So stay tuned for that, do all the YouTube things, and I'll see you next time. Happy New Year.